So um, before uh, getting us started on this presentation, um, there were uh, uh, several available corpora that I could pick one of them and present for my presentations today. And then I came up with two corpora that were very interesting to me for presentation. This is one of them. And the other one is the corpus, uh, which was compiled by uh, Leon Barco. He's an applied linguist and a, and a corpus linguist in Sweden. But I can just uh, present one of them today. But I'm just recommending that corpus uh, is very interesting. So you can um, study uh, that corpus as well. Uh, that before getting started on this actually corpus, which is JPU, I will introduce the corpus in a couple of minutes. Just I want to tell you, uh, uh, talk about a couple of, you know, tell you a couple of sentences about that uh, corpus, the one that I'm not going to present. <laughs> um, you have 10, 15 minutes total. Yes, I manage okay. everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that, that corpus that I'm not going to present <laughs> is actually uh, a corpus that is made by uh, uh, Leon Barco. Uh, uh, he designed and compiled that corpus um, for, um, actually, he, he wanted to analyze his students' mistakes. So he identified some patterns in the corpus, and the corpus is in an authentic settings, and he recorded his own students. And uh, he... Mm, in his book, which is like 260 pages, he uh, explained about the procedures of how the co corpus was compiled and how we identified the patterns and the mistakes, his students' mistakes. And that is a very interesting uh, book. I read the book, so if you don't have the time to read the whole book, to cover the whole book, I summarized the whole book in three pages. And then uh, actually it was a kind of evaluate, evaluative writing. And then, uh, thankfully, it was, it got, last month, it got published in Tesla EJ Journal. So on the next sheet, you can see uh, the very brief summary of that um, 260 pages book. Um, that is, uh, it comes in optional corpus reading. So if you just follow this, you can uh, read uh, the summary of that book, which is very interesting. Um, and uh, so that's it. So as for uh, this corpus, JPU corpus, it's Janusz Panunius University. This is a, a university, uh, this is a former name of the University of Page where I study in um, Hungary. And the corpus is compiled by my uh, professor, one of my professors who is my supervisor uh, on my dissertation in um, that university is Dr. Uh, Horvath Joseph. Is a PhD in applied linguistics there, and um, well, the first features of the corpus is that it's a free corpus and the tools are free. So if you want to use the corpus tools, you can just uh, go to uh, Complete Lex Tutor website to use the features and the tools, and the um, scripts are available at the, the website that I wrote um, there, and the scripts are uh, come in separate entries so that you can just uh, use the script for free. Um, so let me just get um, introduce the corpus a little bit. The JPU corpus was compiled in 1991. So this is the first uh, thing that makes it significant. This corpus was compiled 26 years ago, where uh, corpus linguistics was not as popular as today, um, and contains uh, <coughs> 412,280 uh, words in 332 academic essays and research papers from his collection of Hungarian students writing in English. Well, in that time, this was considered one of the largest written uh, learner English data set, and it was a very large cor corpus in that time. And it represents over twice the size of the individual national subcorpora contained in ICL, I sell whatever, uh, ICL. <laughs> so the corpus has five subcorpora. As you can see, um, the first subcorpora is Russian retraining. There were uh, 16 scripts um, from Russian retraining and 15 females and one male. Uh, they're mostly argumentative essays 
and it accounts for 6% uh, of the whole corpus. And then um, 30 scripts are elective uh, scripts and for, uh, from 21 female and 9 male acad on academic essays on uh, the application of internet. And this is uh, very interesting, like 26 years ago, uh, um, uh, the application of internet and computer assisted language learning was actually a part of that corpus. And uh, language practice, um, there are 74 scripts on language practice, 35 male from and uh, 43 female. These are mostly argumentative essays and narratives. It um, accounts for um, slightly more than 21% of the entire corpus. And the next one is postgraduate, uh, 82 scripts, 68 female and 14 male. Um, and there are postgraduate academic papers. And the last subcorpus sub is writing and research which is the largest uh, subcorpora on uh, 130 scripts, 160 females and 24 male personal essays and research papers, which um, accounts for 26% of the whole corpus. Well, like any other corpus, uh, you can see that the, in terms of the frequency of this corpus, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the frequency of the corpus because maybe uh, you uh, are interested to know that the, these words are actually the frequency of the words that right now you, we know that the most frequent um, word in the corpus, uh, any corpora is the, the article the right now. And, it has always been the same, like 26 years ago was the, you can see here. <laughs> can I clarify one thing? Yes. By sure. scripts, you mean texts, right? This text, okay. yes. Okay. Text, yes. And um, so you can see the most uh, 10 frequent words on the left-hand side, uh, the, of, to, and, and the most 10, ten continent, con content and, or lexical words on the right-hand side. Mm -hmm. Well, they are students writing because the, most of them were academic and uh, you know, academic related text or scripts. Uh, this, you can see students writing essay language people. So the orientations, these are goes towards academic field. And then uh, the 10 most frequent words in the five subcorpora, and you, you can see the five subcorpora here and the frequencies, there is still the most frequent one. And then we have of, but Russian subcorp is a little bit different here for some reasons. Like um, the second most frequent word is of for all of them except for Russian, which is and, and two for all of them except for Russian. No, it's not except for Russian, but the, the uh, and, but for Russian is of. Um, so Russian subcorpus is a little bit different. Turn out to be a little bit different. Well, if you just uh, go to the next sheet, you can see that uh, the files on the, actually, if you go to the website, JPU website, you can, as I said before, you can have the script and the text. And the text comes with, in different, um, actually, separate entries. And you can see here the files. This is just a small part of those um, 100, 300, how much was that? Um, 332 files are there. So this is just a part of them. And you can see that WRL, these stand for um, writing, retraining, language practice. F stands for female, M for male. And uh, so these are coded in this way. And you can download the script and uh, if you want to make some analysis on such things or across these disciplines that are, um, uh, ha are in this corpus. There, and you can find the rest there. So the corpus, and uh, if you want to use the analytical, um, actually, tools for this corpus, you got to go to uh, Lex, uh, Complete Lex Tutor. This is one of the corpora which are which is available in Complete Lex, Comp, uh, Complete Lex Tutor. I'm going to present Complete Lex Tutor in some other sessions with Jeff together. So when it was when it comes to my part, I will talk more about JPU on Lex Tutor. Um, and um, well, as you can see, uh, the screenshot from uh, Lex Tutor, you can just, there, in Lex Tutor, there are several um, corpora. You can just choose JPU 
or any other just in this specific case you can just uh, go for JPU and then you can use the available tools for this corpus. The available tools for this corpus are concordancing, engrams, frequency, collocations, keywords, vocabulary, statistics, and range. I provided a definition for range because I feel like this concept has not been discussed in, in any great detail here in this class. So a range tells you about the distribution of words or other lexical units across a set of two or more texts. The text can be comparable corpora or subdivisions of a corpus or a set of text supplied by a user. I will explain more on Lex user uh, of this feature. So, um, actually, this is great, I think, because you have a lot of tools and uh, you can use it and you can develop some materials for language learners as well, like closed test. You can extract some text and manipulate. You can just uh, change the complexity, like uh, um, make the text more complex, less complex, substitute the academic words with more frequent words to change um, the scripts and make it more like um, upon your own desire. So, and then um, the advantages and disadvantages and signal, let's not call it disadvantages as long as we are on camera, but uh, uh, <laughs> the advantages uh, of this corpus, <laughs> um, it's, fr it's a free corpus tool, scripts are free and available, and step-by-step -step guidelines on how the corpus has been built and subcorpora are and available as separate entities. So these are advantages when you compare it with some other corpora that they are like charge you and for, for the same things. And uh, the other one <laughs> is it, it cannot be like considered a very large corpora nowadays, but it used to be a very large corpora before um, and no new version of that is coming. So the significance <laughs> of the uh, corpus is this corpus was compiled 26 years ago. Uh, at least it is significant for me. I mean, because uh, um, when I just think that 26 years ago um, and the content of the corpus, which are CAL, computer assistive language, research papers, and scripts on internet and these kind of things. Um, so it's kind of significant. And it was used as a methodology, you know, uh, corpus linguistics, there are two views. Some people view it as a theory, not a methodology, but some people view corpus as a methodology. So in that, in that I'm, I'm personally in that side that this is a methodology. But uh, in that time, this was viewed as a methodology. Um, this is significant, I guess. And when corpus, that was not popular in that time. And... Um, so, so I recommend this corpus to everyone. Uh, it's free, you can use it. I will have more explanation and elaborate more on this uh, when we get to Lex user session and how to use the different concordance thing and different um, tools to um, analyze more text with it. Yeah, any question? Russian retraining. Yeah, Russian retraining. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my question. Yeah, yeah. Russian retraining. Well, Russian retraining. Uh, I guess. Well, I, I'm emphasizing. I guess. <laughs> uh, oh yeah. Well, this is this is just my assumption because because <laughs> I was not there in that time. <laughs> but uh, Russian retraining. I think these are the Russians who wanted to uh, who submitted their or they can be either of them. Like they. Okay. Okay, you go for it. <laughs> Focus changed in 1989, okay? And in my time, Russian was compulsory in the schools. So everybody had to learn Russian and you'd learn another second language, uh -huh. right? But Russian was compulsory. So when the changes occurred in 1989, there were suddenly so many Russian teachers who had no jobs because there was no Russian anymore compulsory in the schools. So it's, you still had to take two foreign languages, but it could be English and whatever else, or French and, and German and. 
So there were tons of Russian teachers mm -hmm. who had to be retrained to become English teachers. Wow. Yes. See? <laughs> <laughs> this is exactly what I was trying to say. So, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Just in Hungary. No, oh, it's all across the board. It was so it was a big business actually at the time because the government put a lot of money into these yeah. programs to retain the Russian teachers to become English teachers. At the same time, it was uh, I don't know how successful it was by the end of the day, but that's mm -hmm. a, that's what wow. that's a group of students with special characteristics. That's cool. Right. So I think yeah. that that's their yeah. argument. Like, yeah. What, why do they call it retraining? So it could be a Russian because training. Like well, no, because they are teachers of they Russian, have been but they are retraining them to English, teachers of English. Did they so speak they, English? Well, some of them did, some of them did. <laughs> yeah, it seems really like, you're going to change your foreign language now. Yeah, right. Yeah. I have a question about, um, on the ten most, uh, or no, it's the ten most frequent words in the five subcorpora. Mm -hmm. And it looks like Russian, the second one, they ju it's just switched. So and and yeah. of mm -hmm. are switched. Do you see That's across the yeah. board? Yeah, and mm -hmm. what would account for that, Dr. Chimani? Oh, yeah, I know. That's you know. No, he's <laughs> asking you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't what, really know. I'm <laughs> so, what? My ex girlfriend was Russian. What do you think? That, that, um, why do you think that, Because I don't know, actually. So, you're asking about the. the what, what, what the frequency? Don't you think and is easier than of? The 10 most yeah. frequent. Um, Words in the five subcorpora. Uh huh. It looks like the Russians just they just switched it around, so they're in number two spot with and, and number four spot with of, where it's the opposite hmm. of four sections. I don't think there we can find some kind of meaningful pattern or a meaningful reason for it. It just occurred. It just happened. Like, I mean, accidentally. I think yeah. so. You might it's, you might want to look at the text then and see why that might be. Yeah. It's just, it's interesting to me, I would wonder, you know, maybe it isn't. But yeah, that's why, we don't know their proficiency level would be part of it. Of has been pointed out to us as being used in prepositional phrases, which are used by more advanced students, for example. But there's undoubtedly more than one reason. Yeah. Were these Russians who were teaching Russian, or were they no. Hungarian? No, they are Hungarian. Oh, okay. Russian is their second language, would say. So oh. their second language. Yeah. Were these students in a particular department or just all around the university? Okay. I think they're all in my university. I noticed there's a lot more female than males. So oh. yeah, I thought maybe oh, yeah. teacher training. Well, I was two <laughs> years old in that time. Three, three, three four I years old. Particularly <laughs> from Joe's program, which is uh, English majors and uh, applied linguistics. And Mm -hmm. yeah. That's very interesting, Yvonne. I, w I yeah, wish we actually added more data to this, like from today, you know. It would be wonderful well, to expand it. Uh, see, actually, there are two. Diachronically, too, how it might be different, you know. Uh -huh. Yeah, there, there is another version, but it is just that this one is for 26 years ago. The newest version is for 22 years ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> how about now? <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't. Um, I think it's today because everything's submitted electronically really on most of the papers. So mm -hmm. I think it's a little probably less difficult to even collect these kinds of papers than before perhaps. Yeah, but but there are certain like subcorpora that cannot be easily expanded like the Russian retraining. Yes, I mean that would not do that probably today. So it's not feasible anymore. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it depends. I mean, I think it was, I, he was really cutting edge at the time when he collected mm -hmm. this because it was very novel, very novel. Mm -hmm. And he did a good, good, good job. With these yeah, and his PhD dissertation is based on this corpus. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm.